Welcome back. It's another interview today we've got for you. And I'm joined today by Marius Trotter, who's a writer um, from the United States, who's written a very interesting couple of articles on the history of the American Revolution and the misuses of, of the um, of the, of the misteaching, shall we say, of the American Revolution in our modern era. And also some interesting comparisons between the early economic development of the United States and the more modern, of course, economic development of the People's Republic of China. So, Marius, welcome to the program. Great to be here. And I thought I'd begin by uh, just hooking this onto a local detail. I, of course, reside within Manchester in the northwest of England, which was the centre of the cotton trade in the British Empire days. Um, and was indeed a key um, garment producing city until all the way into the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Not too far away from where I am now, there is a square named Lincoln Square in which uh, stands a rather imposing statue of Abraham Lincoln himself in recognition of the historic connection between Lincoln's presidency, the American Civil War, and of course, something which Marius, you mentioned in your articles is, of course, the Lancashire cotton workers um, boycotting of the cotton of the South and the role that played in deterring Palmerston and others from intervening in the American Civil War. And Lincoln, um, just after the struggle had been won and shortly before his assassination, I believe, wrote a letter to the Lancashire cotton workers thanking them for this act. And this is remembered in the naming of a a square after him now and uh, the installation of a statue and i think the one of the things i wanted to talk about in your article was the way in which this early uh, or relatively early example of international working class solidarity a an act of solidarity with the the oppressed people uh, uh, the slaves of the of the american south is something which is should act as a source of inspiration for everybody who calls themselves a marxist and should act as a a guide for what workers can do. But in the histories of the people like Gerald Horn and the 1619 Project, this kind of thing gets either glossed over, buried, or dismissed, I think, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, very much so. Um, and it's, um, you know, such narratives have been very prevalent on the American left for quite a while, I would say, especially since the new left of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, and I obviously had misgivings about this very dark, pessimistic uh, view of, of American history that was very common on the left that simply reduced the entirety of American history to only slavery, racism, indigenous genocide. Obviously, all these things are a very important part of it. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But the denial of progressive traditions and movements that have existed in spite of all those things um, was always something that rubbed me the wrong way, which I knew also was not true. Mm. I think what changed uh, in recent years is that with the 1619 Project, which was this whole sort of series of articles published about the history of slavery in the United States put out by the New York Times, uh, this kind of dark pessimism um, became part of not just leftism but mainstream you know liberals mm. and so it's so in, in those circumstances a more robust critique of a lot of these uh narratives uh from from the left became i think a lot more urgent mm. uh since it was no longer some sort of fringe thing in some circles of academia or some fringe you know, activist circles, that this was something that was being pushed by a powerful wing of the ruling class, you know, yes. Um, yes. and that this and and it was either this or the kind of right wing nationalist revisionism pushed by the Republicans. And mm. these are presented as the only two choices. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, the, to, to pick up on the uh, the two choices there, because, of course, mm -hmm. uh, all Marxists will know that every historical event is particularly one of significance of the American Revolution is going to be essentially subjected to a ruling class remix every generation mm -hmm. um, to sit the current to, to suit the current needs of capital. I think it's fair to say so. Mm -hmm. In your view, then, what is the the purpose of the of a section of the American ruling class swinging behind 
um, the the narrative of people like Gerald Horn, and I would say mm -hmm. to a certain extent, Howard Zinn is guilty of this as well, um, sure. particularly in, in people's history of the United States. It's the early part of that in particular and the American Revolution is reduced to exactly what you've just described there, which is a, a catalogue of misery and criminality. Mm -hmm. So why would a section of the American ruling class get be get it, be getting behind this? And why would they be pushing it through their premier bourgeois journal, uh, which is, of course, yeah. the New York Times? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought a lot about this. And I think the explanation that makes the most sense to me is um, this sort of crisis that the liberal establishment faced with the victory of Donald Trump mm. in 2016. I think that to me is like, Obviously, this, of course, was an outward expression of a, of a crisis of legitimacy of the liberal establishment that had been building for quite some time. But it, it, with Trump's victory, shocking victory over Hillary Clinton, it kind of reached this political breaking point. Hmm. And I think that um, the reason The New York Times put out the 1619 Project is because it provided a very convenient explanation for the Democratic Party's defeat. Mm. Um, which basically the entire media elite didn't foresee that this could actually happen, that Trump could actually win. Uh, and a huge part of that is, of course, the erosion of working class support for the Democratic Party over many decades, mm. particularly the white rural working class, but all segments of the working class uh, have been voting for the Democrats less and less because of the betrayal of the Democratic Party's mandate to defend the New Deal and to mm. defend unions and to defend the living conditions of um, of the working class. But to honestly grapple with that is not something that the liberal elite in the United States wanted to do, because mm. uh, that would require extensive self-criticism of where the Democratic Party has been going over the last 50 years, at least. Yes. So instead of doing that, they've They've embraced this narrative of history in which um, white people, but particularly the white working class, is irredeemably racist mm -hmm. and tainted by the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, which they are to blame for mm -hmm. and not the ruling class. Right. Um, and, um, and that basically black people and other minorities, therefore, can never make any class based alliances with you know this basket of deplorables as Hillary Clinton liked to call them. Mm. And the only hope of salvation for African Americans and other marginalized people is to appeal to conveniently the liberal elite to mm. save them, you know, essentially. Yeah. And and so that's what I think was the interest in pushing this race reductionist uh, view of history. They basically, it was a rewriting of all of American history just to rationalize the bankruptcy and the unpopularity of the neoliberal Democratic Party. Yes. And you see this in a, a number of countries now, I think. The mm -hmm. uh, the the way in which the the establishment parties respond to defeats in the in the last five to six years, I think, has often been brought down to that there is this wild extremist section of the deplorables, as you say, who are mm -hmm. um, so stupid that they are conned by, you know, ads on Facebook. And therefore, we need mm -hmm. to clamp down on social media. And we need to keep this dangerous group in check via increased censorship, via um, keeping dangerous ideas away from them. And the the bitterness and the rage of like the likes of Hillary Clinton and Obama towards the American working class is very much um, part of like, I'd say it's it's core to much of American mainstream, so-called mainstream culture now, this absolute loathing of the American working class and the reduction yeah. of um, the reduction of the, the the black and Asian working class essentially to little more than ciphers or cartoonish versions or perpetual victims. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The idea that these people are, of course, equals doesn't seem to occur to the the liberal writers of most um, of the propagandistic stuff you see on television. And it seems that the uh, the the American left has embraced all of this 
Um, and in doing so, of course, has confirmed its uh, complete rejection of any connection with the American working class now and is desperately clinging to the liberal end of the American bourgeois in the belief that somehow um, that this will preserve elements of, I don't know what, elements of the New Deal, perhaps, for some of them, even though the Democrats have spent 40 years attacking it. What What is the left's motivation, as you see it, for clinging so hard to the Democratic Party and the liberal end of the American bourgeois? I think there's two components, honestly. I think there is, of course, class and political self-interest. Mm -hmm. And then I think there is also this emotional and psychological component as mm -hmm. well. So the first that I will deal with is obviously the class component. You know, it's like like in Britain, you know, the left such as it exists is a primarily middle class phenomenon. Mm -hmm. They tend to come from the professional milieu uh, that tends to support the urbanized, you know, professional milieu that tends to support the Democrats. And so, of course, there's a certain class interest in clinging to the Democrats, even if they claim more radical pretensions, that's ultimately what wins out at the end of the day, mm. um, as opposed to the working class of, of all ethnicities, which they are actually pretty detached and alienated from, for the most part. Um, so that's that's a very obvious example, you know, and of course they use all this moralizing, you know, to justify it. But I think there's a psychological component as well. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, very simply, is white guilt. Mm. I mean, that's a huge part of it, is all kinds of problematic, factually untrue narratives mm -hmm. get sort of passed along and accepted because it fits in with this pervasive white guilt, you know, which is a huge thing, uh, particularly mm. on the left. Um you know, it's understandable, understandable where it comes from. We do have a horrible, horrible history with racism. We do have a hard and then and a present, you know, mm. racism still persists. And there is very obvious inequalities in American society to this day, which are racialized. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's, of course, you know, obvious. So especially a lot of young people, when they're in the process of getting radicalized for the first time, and they learn some of the uglier aspects of American history. And they learn about, you know, the way that this affects the country that they live in to this day. Of course, they get angry and they get outraged, you know, as any decent human being should. Um, but the problem is, and I think social media has contributed to this, is there's not enough going beyond that initial visceral moralistic reaction and actually trying to think about the roots of things. You know, mm. where does this actually come from? Why has racism been such an important um, sort of tool, you know, of, of ruling class elites for so long? What mm. purpose does that serve? There's not a lot of dealing with that. Usually very, very superficial, mm. um, you know, coming to terms with that. And also social media just award, rewards you if, you know, if you're just angry and loud and, uh, aggressive enough that makes you right basically uh the social media space which many millennial zoomer leftists interact with all the time um is not conducive to a calm rational discussion of mm. why phenomena occurs yeah so so i think so yeah i think there's two components or to it and of course there's also you know and then there's also like us of an even smaller group of people who have basically made their careers for promoting this kind of history. Hmm. Porn is one of them. There's a lot of others, though, in academia and in the NGO world and in the sort of activist industrial complex, who it's not really in their interest to get at the truth. It's their interest to push a certain sensationalist line that will, you know, get them promotions and interviews and grants and, you know, so on. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. Uh, Gerald Horn, if he continue, continues in the manner that he does in his uh, the book that you critique, could easily earn himself a knighthood from uh, certain elements in the British establishment who are still sore about 1776, because the narrative that he presents there is actually mm -hmm. the narrative that you will find in some of the more conservative reactionary sections of British uh, academia went behind closed doors when they've when they've had a brandy and feel safe. They'll talk about how um, that Britain was the one 
leading the way on abolishing slavery and uh, these dastardly Americans got in the way of it to, um, you know, as Horn argues, secure their own privileges and profits by stopping the wave of abolitionism that was coming. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a classic example of you to use a, my, my favorite quotes from Stalin, the ultra leftist deviation in fact, actual fact being a rightist one, because yeah. I would never have believed that a sort of pseudo Maoist would be redeeming the British Empire. But there he is uh, doing exactly yeah. that. And you got a, it's not just him, as you say, there's an awful lot of them running around out there doing this, promoting yeah. what you and others um, have called um, a form of national nihilism. And I can't help but think that part of the reason why they're doing it and why they're being promoted is because they, the ruling class would rather have angry, recently politicized younger people in a self-destructive cycle of self-loathing than actually learning from American history from its earliest origins through to the, the heroic period of the CPUSA and all of that. Um, they'd rather have them in this sort of perpetual loop of um, despair sandwiched between like the cartoon version of Mao and the uh, sort of bastardized version of Theodore Adorno in a sort of uh, perpetual angry nihilistic outrage that leads them nowhere except for right back to Joe Biden again or voting yeah. Democrat at the next election what do you what do you think about that yeah, I mean, I you know, I think it it serves a similar function that a lot of this uh, right wing nationalism does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it basically is, it just it's just a different set of scapegoats. Mm -hmm. You know, the right wing nationalists they point the finger at immigrants and China and trans people or whatever you know mm -hmm. whatever that whatever their boogeyman is, and uh, and they just get endlessly angry and they just they scream about doing stupid things like building a border wall and other things that don't actually help. Um, and it's the same, the same with this kind of nihilistic, you know, white guilt obsessed mm. uh, leftism. It's it's just it's like it's a, it's a huge effusion of energy, uh, which doesn't actually lead anywhere concrete except de facto or overt support of the Democratic Party, mm. uh, because because the white working class is just so hopelessly you know, racist and bigoted, et cetera. That's the only thing you have left to do. Yes. Um and it's about constantly castigating the vast majority of the population for not being as enlightened as you are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, there's a very middle class undercurrent to all of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think this is a big part of it. Is I think it's because, you know, the, the ruling class realized, especially post-2016, they're in a serious crisis of legitimacy. And that mm -hmm. sort of conventional liberalism was not going to cut it. And so they, they're, they're playing on... They're targeting populations of people who potentially could be radicalized mm. against the overall system, but then promoting a narrative where they will just go down these dead ends, yeah. basically. Yes, it's yeah. certainly it's certainly a case of um, the we weaponization of a certain form of history uh, mm -hmm. to pl uh, play the role of, if not a legitimation process for a ruling class in crisis, then at least... Uh, as you say, uh, pushing a nihilism that uh, doesn't lead the rebellious anywhere. So mm -hmm. let's turn back now to um, the uh, the actual uh, American Revolution itself and mm -hmm. how you how you characterize it and how you've written about it, because I think this is an interesting approach here. And you you draw sp specifically some inspiration from earlier writers who did have a a more proper understanding of it, like Herbert Aptica, like uh, mm -hmm. W. E. B. Du Bois. And mm -hmm. what struck me from reading your uh, piece was that earlier Marxist writers, both America in, a, in the United States and going back to Marx and Engels themselves, were able to properly understand bourgeois revolutions. Um, mm -hmm. They were able to analyze the fact that this these were events which took not just the United States as it was to become, but took the human race potentially forward through great leaps, both economically and socially and that these were tremendously important events that needed to be taken seriously. And that's what you get from reading uh, Marx's writing on the Civil War. It's what you get yes. from reading uh, the, um, Engels' analysis of it as well. And mm -hmm. so that was understood in the 19th century. The complex nature of the bourgeois revolutions was understood. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, all of that is lost because uh, the I would say that the, the proletarian intellectual... Um, 
tr trend that did exist in the United States and in Britain, that trend got destroyed, I think, probably in our case by the 70s, uh, in your case, maybe earlier. But yeah. it, that's something I think we need to recapture is the ability to actually do a historical materialist analysis in a way that isn't just do, going down the route of hysterical moralism, which is all that a lot of the left groups do now. It's just this moralistic outrage that they want to push their members towards. So I wondered mm -hmm. if you could say something about the the older tradition of how the American Revolution was treated by like Aptica and Du Bois and how that should be something that perhaps we should work back towards. Yeah, um, I've read more of, I mean, I've read more of Du Bois, so I will speak, I'll speak more to him, although I, you know, Aptecker obviously is very close to Du Bois. He's the executor of Du Bois' estate, who's a chief theorist of the American Communist Party, even wrote a whole book about the American Revolution. Hmm. Um, I mean, actually, I mean, I pretty much go through over some of this ground in my article critiquing Gerald Horn, where hmm. I basically quote, because Horn claims to come out of the Marxist tradition. He was in the CPUSA at one point, although we're beginning, we kind of know that doesn't mean much anymore. Mm. But, um, but you know, I basically provide quotes uh, from, um, I mean, Lenin and Mao and Ho Chi Minh and, you know, all these major figures and all of them are saying um, that it was a, that the American Revolution was a progressive event uh, for its time, the most extensive coming from from Lenin, where not only does he tell American workers that they should be proud of their revolutionary history, but he even draws an equation between the 13 colonies rebellion against Britain in 1776 and the anti-colonial rebellions against British rule in his own time, hmm. you know, and um, I think, uh, I mean, the, the particularly the American Communist Party, uh, very much always tried, and especially in its high point in the 30s and 40s, always tried to emphasize that the striving towards socialism was a continuation of uh, the more progressive ideas of the American Revolution. Mm. Um, and in the American Civil War. I mean, they they formed the Spanish Civil War. They formed what was their brigade? It was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade mm. you know, that went to fight fascism in Spain. Um, the, Commun the American Communist Party had a bookstore that was called the Thomas Jefferson Bookstore. Mm. You know, um, they, uh, you know, the, they're famous, whatever you want to criticize about him. You know, Earl Browder had that slogan that, you know, communism is 20th century Americanism, mm. you know, and they marched around with the flag and they presented themselves as patriots. And I mean, all of that is just sort of unthinkable in the post 1960s American left mm. uh, to try to to push things in that in that light. And yet at the same time, this is the thing that's important to realize. At the same time, they were also at the vanguard of fighting for equal rights for black people mm. um, and, you know, defending the the Scottsboro defendants and, you know, organizing interracial um, trade unions, which mm -hmm. was a, a very big step for the trade union movement at that time. And uh, probably most significantly, W.B. Du Bois wrote his masterwork about radical reconstruction, black reconstruction. It was published in 1936, and he dedicated the book to the, to the CIO, to the Congress mm -hmm. of Industrial Organizations which was one of the first big biracial trade union federations in American mm. history. So he saw, he saw the process, the American revolutionary process, which culminated in the American Civil War and Reconstruction as being carried forth by the radical left-wing trade union mm. of his time. Um, and I don't think you, Du Bois is not someone you can accuse of being some kind of uh, reductionist who overlooked you know, racism or the mm -hmm. or the effects of racism in American society. So, you know, without getting too deep into the weeds, there was this because I think the American Communist Party in the 30s was seriously concerned with aiming for concrete political power. Mm. And they were making great strides towards that. And so in that for for that very reason, it was imperative that they tried to identify their movement 
with the more progressive traditions in American history. Yes. Uh, even if it wasn't the people who called themselves socialists, they at least were saying, we're caring for some of the nobler things that they may have fought for, even if they didn't achieve them, maybe if they were, even if there were contradictions. Hmm. Um, and that, that is just, that's just nowhere to be seen now, you yes. know, and hasn't for quite some time. Yes. Um, and I, mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say the, yeah. um, the, the American, the, the CPUSA in the thirties, similar to the CPGB were, these might have been relatively small organizations, but these were organizations that aimed to root themselves in the working class of the United States, mm-hmm. of Britain. Mm-hmm. And so therefore they needed to take seriously um, the the history of well, the, uh, the the classes, the class they were trying to organize in, the the way the class understood um, American, American, the American nation, the Amer- American history, and also to be able to tap into a national tradition of struggle by essentially analyzing properly the Enlightenment tradition itself, which is that mm-hmm. for you know people like uh, Jefferson, people like uh, Thomas Paine, um, or if you go throw it further afield uh, into the French Revolution, figures like Robespierre or thinkers like Voltaire, um, all of these are titanic figures of their particular period and all of which of course saw, um, co- uh, conducted their uh, philosophical debates and their polemics in the language of the of universal rights in the uh, with the idea of um, the idea of this form of uh, radical equality which although flawed because of course it does exclude um, rather a lot of different rather a lot of groups including workers uh, chattel slaves and others the mere fact that that is expressed that we are no longer conducting ourselves in language of chosen kings and you know lines of legitimacy given out by the almighty this is like a hammer blow to the ideas of heredity to the ideas of um that property should rule no matter what i mean even people like thomas hobbes um, an earlier philosopher from the british tradition admitted and he was in this regard as a conservative figure was forced to admit yes there may be circumstances under which rebellion is legitimate you know john locke mm-hmm. said the same things so even we even if you see this all as a bourgeois con the fact is that with increasing levels of literacy this comes to be embraced even by those who it was meant to exclude and so you you need to see this as a sort of evolving picture, as you say. And the mm-hmm. fact that people can't see that or refuse to or just chuck it out there, chuck out the uh, the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, it, it goes against the Marxist understanding of the Enlightenment tradition, doesn't it? Yes. And I think it and I think it also reflects the fact that um, a lot of progressives have a stunning lack of interest in the roots of like the very egalitarian uh, ideas that they that they so enthusiastically promote mm. because like yes of course as any civilized person in the 21st century you know you acknowledge that you know slavery was a crime against humanity and uh, the genocide of the native americans was horrendous and the way that women were treated in that period was horrendous and you know all these things however th- the question is why do you think those things are bad? You know, Mm. why do you think those things are so egregious and at odds with your values? Did those, do those values just come out of the sky or are they just innate? Um, When in reality, a lot of the conceptions to both first liberalism, and then I would say a lot of socialism, uh, the idea human beings having the whole idea that there is something, such thing as consent of the governed, the fact Mm. that there is a right to rebel, against unjust and exploitative uh, rule. All these all these ideas, all these concepts, and then these political praxis um, come out of the Enlightenment, of course, which was the intellectual, uh, which, which went in tandem with the rise of the bourgeoisie against the mm-hmm. old feudal aristocracy. And of course, we can talk all day about how hypocritical it was, but once that break was made, once it was established that these white property owning men could rebel and overthrow the government and establish a republic 
uh, a non-hereditary, non-monarchical republic because they felt their rights, their natural given rights were being trampled, that inevitably opened all these other questions. Well, if they have that right, then what? how much more of a right do slaves have? How much mm. more of a right do, do women have? How much more of a right do property you know, working class people have uh, to make those to make that kind of uh, rebellion and to try to rearrange society in their own way. So I think the problem is, is that there is this hyper focus on the limitations and a and yet they're st- yet they're they're standing on this foundation of centuries of bourgeois liberalism being hegemonic mm. when in the 17th and 18th century it was not. Mm. So, okay. yeah. I find it particularly ironic when anarchists do this, given that their forefather Bakunin was an enthusiast for the Confederacy. But that's a yeah, that's and Proudhon, a, yeah, and, and Proudhon, Proudhon, of course, as well, uh, ultra Catholic yeah. anti Semite Confederacy lover, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. which um, is something that anarchists never seem to address. But going mm-hmm. back to the uh, the the events of the American Revolution itself, then mm-hmm. you have um, I found it just as a side note particularly hilarious in the be- the the beginning of your article critiquing horn when you pick up on a, a quote that he has completely mangled out of context uh from being an anti-slavery quote and he turns it into a pro-slavery quote in a way that only that reminded me of um the way in which the likes of robert conquest write about stalin it's like mm-hmm. they'll pick something up and say ah well this this line here that i've selected proves that stalin was a mass murderer and you you go back and you check the quote like as Professor Grover Fur does in all of his work, and you can see it's like a long quote stating about Stalin's triumphs or something. But the fact that Horn begins his work by taking that and ripping it out of context and presenting it as his opposite, his opposite, it's remarkable that that level of, uh, well, it's not even scholarship, that level of distortion could be gotten away with. But it's typical yeah. of the whole approach, which is essentially trying to stand this thing on its head. Now, you identify in your work the the fact that, as you you say, that the the American Revolution, uh, this tremendous event, uh, was a a somewhat premature uh, bourgeois revolution uh, for its mm-hmm. time, because of the, uh, the 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 gap between the ideas being expressed and the, the limitations of the productive base. So, could you talk a little bit about that uh, before we go further? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I go in a lot more detail in the in the second article in my series mm. um which is yeah called from the american system to the chinese dream um yeah i mean basically the 13 colonies were sort of economically structured like pretty much all the british and european colonies were they were not meant to be autonomous economic entities uh, they were just meant to be just trading hubs basically for the mother country um an extraction point of uh, raw materials um, and 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 little else. So, um, so you had a situation where in New England, in the mid-Atlantic states like Pennsylvania um, and New York, you you had the emergence of this small but significant uh, sort of mercantile, you know, bourgeoisie, which uh, which felt set up put upon basically by. By British taxes and British regulations, and the fact that if you were, if you were an educated man of means in who was born and raised in the colonies, um, there was only so far that you could go up the ladder because you were not a British aristocracy or yeah. old money, you know. Um, but they only really had significant. Um, you know, the emergence of this sort of embryonic capitalist economy, this only really emerged in a more advanced way um, in, in the northern in the New England, you know, trading hub colonies. So in order to have enough support to really break away from the British, they had to make an alliance with the with the uh, plantation aristocracy of the South. Um, and it was an alliance of convenience uh, at the time. And of course, many of the the great many of the major figures of the uh, of the American Revolution came from that plantation aristocracy: Washington, Jefferson, particularly Virginia, which was the oldest and most well-established colony. But um, 
But once the British were defeated, that uh, that led to kind of a serious problem in the development of the United States, because ultimately these were different classes with divergent uh, interests, which were which they could suppress for a time. But uh, as the United States continued to expand, continued to take more land from the Native Americans, and there, there started to be this issue of um, the balance of political power between the growing industrial capitalist economy of the North and the semi-feudal slaveholding system of the South. And so it became a very heated political issue of which states would be part of one system and which states would come of whatever system. And of course, eventually this culminates in, 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 the, in the Civil War. So, so, I mean, the second article in particular, I go into great detail about how a succession of the more, you could say, far-sighted segment of the American bourgeoisie uh, tried to promote the economic development of the United States and the industrialization of the United States to try to overcome this problem. And they were partially successful, but for a variety of reasons, which I'll probably go into later, hmm. uh, it could eventually only be resolved in a cataclysmic civil war, which I basically argue was an extension of the original revolution to begin with. Yes. And just to go back to the the planter class, the you yeah. uh, talk about them. And because, of course, this goes to um, refute Horn's thesis about like the the, the reasons yeah. for the Civil War. The way you discuss them is that they are essentially a a comprador element that remains tied by their interests, their economic interests to the British Empire via the supply of cotton. And it is this which uh, pro uh, provides uh, the inspiration for uh, political figures such as John C. Calhoun, who is very much a representative of this group, who is, again, ve vehemently against the development of the country in the way that you've just been describing there. So can you talk about the, the way that the American South actually Im immediately after independence still fitted into that British yeah, Empire sure. network and what that meant? Well, I would I would want to actually start with the revolution itself because mm -hmm. because one of the when i was arguing against horn's arguments about slave preserving slavery being the motivation for the revolution i point out that the parts of the 13 colonies where loyalist pro-british sentiment was most prevalent tended to be in the south mm -hmm. precisely in the place where slavery was the most widespread uh, as as a practice and then in fact the british were fully aware of this and they focused a lot of their most significant uh, military campaigns on the South because they knew they would be operating in a much more friendly population um, mm. of white settlers uh, than elsewhere in the country, which is kind of a, just a, I mean, just that fact alone, which is very well documented. I mean, they have records about how many, how many American colonists, uh, you know, fought for the, for the loyalist cause and the two places where there were the most recruits were the Carolinas, where of course slavery was prevalent everywhere. And also New York, which was the greatest concentration of slaves um, in the pre-independence uh, 13 colonies. Um, so it starts there. And then uh, regarding the, regarding since, since independence and the early development of the United States, um, what it basically came down to is that first you had leaders like Alexander Hamilton, and then later the 19th century statesman, Kentucky statesman Henry Clay, um, were very prominent in promoting what they called, first it was called the American School, then it later was called the American System, um, which was a developmental project for the United States. And it basically had three components, three main components. One was a government bank um, for financing projects that were of national interest. And then second, there were it was a system of heavy tariffs on imported British goods um, in order to protect American manufacturing um, so that you know British goods would be more expensive and that would that would help the northeastern and midwestern manufacturing to grow. Um, and then third was what they called a system of internal improvements, which were basically government funded or at least government credit extended to uh, various large infrastructure programs, mostly roads, canals, later railroads, um, to facilitate interstate commerce. Hmm. Um, and 
mostly about connecting the Midwest with the agricultural Midwest across the Appalachians <clears throat> with um, the industrial hubs of the Northeastern New England, United States. And so therefore the flow of agricultural goods then you know flowing to that other part of the country so they could be manufactured and then exported. And so therefore making the United States uh, more of a continental economy Mm. Uh, where there is all this interstate commerce going on within the continent of North America, as opposed to just merely being a bunch of seaports that were completely dependent on Europe. Mm. And um, the Southern slave owners, uh, I mean, there were exceptions. I mean, Henry Clay was himself <laughs> a slave owner, mm. but most of the slave owners in the South were completely against this program and did everything they could to sabotage it. And the main reason was they um, they they were just not interested in, in investing in manufacturing. They basically just wanted to raise these cash crops like cotton and other things, export them to Europe, and then whatever manufactured goods they needed, they would just buy it from Europe. Hmm. That, that was all they were interested in. Um, and in addition, they were frightened by improved the prospect of improved infrastructure of the South. Because since they were presiding over a very brutally exploited, unfree labor force, the slaves, mm. um, making communication and transportation easier would, one, make it easier for slaves to escape. And number two, the poor whites who had miserable wages in the South, who had miserable wages because they're competing with people who aren't working for any wages at all, mm. um, it would make it easier for the poor whites, the working class whites, to simply go north. For better wages hmm. so at every turn the southern slaveocracy represented by Calhoun and also andrew jackson and others hmm. did everything they could to sabotage this this program hmm. um and uh even going as far as to threaten secession and civil war hmm. um and in fact when the confederacy when the confederacy declared its secession from the union one of the provisions in the Confederate Constitution was forbidding internal improvements, <laughs> because to them this was a you know this was this was a violation of states' rights. It was a viol it was a, it went was at odds with laissez faire you know classical liberal economics. Hmm. So you know this was a very important issue to them, and they saw the extension of government power, northern government power, for these infrastructure projects as just one step removed. From the power to emancipate the slaves. Mm. That's what they saw lurking behind all of it. And well, uh, yeah, yeah, in in a, in a strange way, um, they weren't actually completely wrong about their regarding their fear of development from mm. their own class interest uh, perspective. They, he's a very mm -hmm. parochial bunch, personified by the likes of Calhoun, who, as you write in, uh, in your article, um, was able to come up with a whole theory about preventing class conflict by preserving slavery, basically by yeah. having this uh, system where the, the poor white man would find his place just above the slave. And so mm -hmm. from their point of view, it was absolutely, absolutely right to deny improvements because the, the spread of uh, industrial capitalism, the spread of free labor would be absolutely fatal uh, mm -hmm. for the slaveocracy. And as you mm -hmm. um, mentioned there in, in your previous answer, you have this period in the uh, the period prior to the Civil War where you get the, the tariff wars, you get the disputes over the extension of territory, you get a very bitter political atmosphere in the United States, uh, very, very polarized between uh, the, the slave-aligned uh, parties and the more progressive uh, Northeast industrialist-aligned uh, characters. Mm -hmm. And this is produces almost... Uh, comp near political deadlock in the national mm -hmm. politics of the United States, doesn't it? Certainly in the periods of like, the presidencies of people like Van Buren and others, mm -hmm. which just end in, you get these one-term presidents ending in complete failure. You get a lot of uh, attempt at compromises, all of which completely fail before finally um, the, things are sparked arguably by John Brown at Harper's Ferry. So, mm -hmm. This period is, um, you identify it as basically, this is a continuation of the struggles of the revolution itself going through 
a very painful process of shaking out the contradictions that were there by the temper that had been put there by the temporary alliance with the planters that now needed to be overcome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, one thing I would add, though, is um, the sort of the sort of um, I would say, I mean, there was the northeastern bourgeoisie, uh, mm -hmm. industrial bourgeoisie, and there was also this kind of emerging agricultural bourgeoisie in the Midwest, and so they had sort of aligned interests. I think Clay kind of spoke for the the latter in the Midwest, but I think what's interesting is um, even though Jackson succeeded in sort of destroying a lot of these ambitions on a national level, I mean, he took down the National Bank, he reversed a lot of the protectionist tariffs. What's very interesting is that the, the Whig Party and then later the Republican Party representing that developmentalist wing of the bourgeoisie managed to implement a lot of these ideas on a local level and a mm. state level, you know, regardless. And, you know, in the pre-Civil War United States, the federal government had a lot less authority back then than it did now. And most citizens' day-to-day -day lives were more affected by state governments, the acting state governments, than, um, than national ones. And what's really fascinating is that in Illinois, Abraham Lincoln began his political career championing the American system in mm. Illinois. And he was very active. And he was, he was an adamant follower of Henry Clay. Called mm. Henry Clay his like his political idol, basically, his hero. And he um he uh championing he championed the so when he was like a a state uh, he was in the state government in Illinois as a Whig, and he championed the uh the establishment of uh, of a state bank for Illinois. He was on the um, he was the chair of this like canal. He was on this canal commission, which helped build this canal with state funds uh, connecting Lake Michigan with uh, with the Mississippi River, which mm. was a huge breakthrough at that time. Um, and so, what this what this did was is even though the Southern slaveocracy had this stranglehold on these national institutions like the Supreme Court and the Senate and so on, these actions by these state governments um, managed to widen the gap in development between the Midwestern and Northeastern states and the South. So mm -hmm. you had this retrograde um, economic system which continued to hold, was propped up by aspects of the political system while the economic system was actually shifting underneath its feet. Mm. But finally, all that was left to do was the conquest of political power. Mm. And that came to a head with the election of Lincoln and then the Civil War. So so this is this leads us neatly into a, <clears throat> um, a, a discussion of Lincoln himself and the the effect of, should we say, um, both the the abolitionist movement, the the actions of the more radical elements like John Brown, and mm. of course the the need that Lincoln had, of course, to to win the Civil War, takes him pretty far away from his starting point in the later 1850s, I would say, mm -hmm. given that he even uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, even after his elect his first election, he was still talking about a compromise with the South yeah. and trying to find yeah. one. But by shortly after that, he starts to be pushed in a much more radical direction. Um, mm -hmm. thanks to both the the intransigence of the of the southern planters but also the 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 coalition that had gathered around lincoln and were have were consumed of which consisted of people who were much more radical than he was so his yeah. Le lincoln seems to be a case of a of a leader who was both of course obviously a very significant personality but he's someone who is shaped by i would argue a mass movement isn't he yeah, I mean, what you have to understand, so as I pointed out before, Lincoln came from the Whig Party, mm. um, which was obviously led by Henry Clay. Uh, but uh, in 1852, the two most significant figures of the Whig Party, uh, well, yeah, I mean, by 1852, the two most significant figures of the Whig Party, both Henry Clay and also Daniel Webster, who was their leader in the Northeast, they both died mm. uh, within months of each other. Uh, and so the party lacked strong leadership. And while it had been focused on trying to implement this American system, 
uh, and actually did have a southern wing as opposed to just a northern wing. Um, the polarization over slavery had become so intense that uh, once that became the main focus, the Whig Party couldn't hold together and, mm -hmm. and basically collapsed. Um, and so there was a sort of pro-slavery wing of the Whig Party that was called the Cotton Whigs, and they just sort of joined the Southern Democrats, the Jacksonian Democrats. And then there was, um, and then there was another one called the Compromise Whigs, which kind of became its own sort of not very effective party called the Constitutional Union Party, which just wanted compromise no matter what. But then there was the uh, Conscience Whigs, who were against slavery, and that became part of the nucleus of the Republican Party, hmm. which uh, which Lincoln um, you know became the leader of eventually. And it was it was a very broad alliance. You know, it was an alliance between various different class forces. Um, the industrial capitalists supported it. Um, you had small property owners in the Midwest and the Northeast, and of course, laborers, hmm. you know, much of the working class. And um, Lincoln was always clear that he detested slavery morally. Hmm. But he did not think that immediate abolition was feasible. Um, and he also had to appeal to uh, you know, he had to win votes in an extremely reactionary electorate, which with racism was extremely prevalent and open. And as it was, when he did win in 1860, he only won 40% of the vote, 40 mm. something percent of the vote, he did not win a majority. Um, the only reason he won was because the Democrats actually divided. <laughs> uh, the Democrats actually split in two um, because over, again, the disagreement with how vehemently they defended slavery. <laughs> <laughs> um so in that climate lincoln only made you know very moderate statements about it uh, mm. he, he always said that he he was elected in 1860 by saying that he only opposed he didn't oppose slavery where it already existed he only opposed its expansion into the western territories um but you know given the the south's complete inability and unwillingness to compromise. Um, he was pushed into a more radical position, you know, and then eventually as the Civil War went on and on um, and he was prosecuting it, he realized that the only way that he could win the war was to support emancipation for the slaves since that was the economic backbone mm. of the Southern War effort. And of course, throughout all of that, you had obviously had the actions of people like John Brown, you had prominent abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips and others who were relentlessly and constantly pressuring him, hmm. you know, to take more decisive action. And as the crisis deepened, Lincoln, uh, while it was not his first instinct, came to the recognition that he had no choice, hmm. you know, and that was also the consensus of the industrial bourgeoisie. They yes. would have liked nothing more but to make a compromise. But they were forced into a corner of taking revolutionary measures for the sake of their own survival. And you can see that also with um, Lincoln's um, picking up and discarding various generals who proved it manifestly inadequate. The most mm -hmm. famous example, I think, is being McClellan, who yeah. would later run against Lincoln on the Democratic ticket, I think. Um, the, the, there seemed to be in that early period in 1861 62 that there was a residual unwillingness on behalf of the behalf of the bourgeoisie and the military and political establishment um to actually prosecute the war to its fullest um mm -hmm. and hence why he has to ultimately get rid of mcclellan and push much further yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, McClellan was, I mean, McClellan was uh, what they call a, a war Democrat. Mm. Um, he was, he opposed the Confederacy because he was opposed to disunion, considered mm. it, you know, treasonous. But he was also against emancipation. Yeah. Um, and this became a huge liability in mm. the course of the war, because McClellan was trying to beat this enemy, but not beat them too badly. <laughs> <laughs> which is just you know it was it, it ended up just being an impossible thing to do in fact um there were even people in the north who thought mcclellan had some secret southern sympathies uh, mm. because there were there were a number of occasions 
where he had superior forces and actually had an opportunity to inflict a decisive defeat on the South. But he just didn't pull it off. He just didn't give the order to do it. And mm. uh, and so uh, Lincoln, you know, Lincoln eventually got fed up with him uh, and, and fired him. Uh, probably the last straw was when uh, McClellan did defeat the Confederates in a major battle in Antietam in uh, Sharpsburg in September 17th, 1862. Um, but the only reason he beat McClellan, is, but I'm saying he beat uh, Lee, was because his officers had the extraordinary good fortune of finding Robert E. Lee's battle plans uh, <laughs> in an abandoned military campsite. I mean, it was like, you know, mm. they had basically been given this this victory, you mm. know, and it was after that battle that uh that lincoln felt he finally had a convincing union victory to uh announce the emancipation proclamation so it was mm. a very very important battle um but then mcclellan just sat there for mm. weeks on end refusing to pursue lee mm. like he had an opportunity to destroy lee's entire force and the war he didn't do that and that's finally what led to lincoln firing you know mcclellan um so so, but then when he finally got people like Grant and Sherman and others on board, uh, they understood the nature of this war much better and understood its radical and revolutionary nature and mm. took that to its logical conclusions. Well, um, this has been uh, a really interesting discussion of the uh, the writings you've done on this, Marius. You'll have to come back at some point in the near future and talk about the Reconstruction period because a lot of yes. there's a lot of interesting stuff in there which I want to bring out as well. But um, what we'll do is we'll link to the two articles that you've done on this uh, in the show notes when it comes out. And I'll conclude just by asking you, uh, what's the next uh, project that you're working on in this? Yeah. So um, as I explained before, my first article was a criticism of of Horn's book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776. The second was a much more extensive article talking about the history of the industrialization of the United States, and how that was an extension of the American Revolution. And then I also compare it to the Chinese Revolution and the mm. reform and opening up period. I sort of identify common threads there. So the third one is going to kind of circle back a bit. Um, um, it's going to talk about the kind of semi-economic revolution that occurred in the United States with the New Deal and the Works Projects Administration, which the uh, Socialists and communists in the trade union movement obviously played an integral role, in making a lot of that possible. And how with the building of that social state, um, you had a context in which you had a left intelligentsia that was always um, in tandem with the movements of the working class, because mm -hmm. that was like a constituency that it had to listen to. It had to make its scholarship relevant to it. and that with the um with the dismantling of the industrial base of so much of the united states uh in the neoliberal era from the 1970s onward that physical foundation on which a healthy left intelligentsia could flourish was gone mm. and so once the material economy faded then the basis for a healthy materialist analysis mm. <laughs> faded from the left intelligentsia was simply retreated into the Ivy Leagues and just, you know, sailed off their merry way into idealism and fantasy. Um, yes. So that's sort of, that's how it kind of, that's the third part. And that's how it kind of circles back to the original critique that makes yeah, uh, sounds like it's going to be an interesting read. Look forward to looking it over, Marius. Well, uh, thank you for your time today. It's been a very interesting and illuminating discussion. And I'm uh, indebted to you for your um, time that you've given us. So thank you. And uh, we look forward to having you back at some point. Okay, pleasure. Bye-bye.